Hello there, my friends. Uh, I know you have exam tomorrow, so here I am to help you a little more with some bonus uh, sample question and answers for your TLS pedagogy exam. I've included some new and unique topics such as self-efficacy in our students and uh, uh, there are teaching techniques such as uh, uh, writing journals and many more. So let's not wait any further and dive into the video. Uh, in this video, I'm going to discuss these topics with the help of sample questions and we'll try to figure out the answers as well. So our first, uh, there are topics like uh, self-efficacy and our students uh, teaching techniques such as writing journals or seating arrangements in a classroom. Uh, this question is from, uh, you know, classroom management. There are questions about learning styles which are frequently given in the exam and the difference between project-based learning and making projects. So let's get started. Let's see our first question. Which of the following assessment methods is most likely to yield valid information about what students know and understand? So let's highlight the keywords here. Which of the following assessment methods is most likely to yield valid information? Although all the assessments give us some information about students know and understand but here we have to highlight the keyword the valid information okay so let's say uh, information informal observation with a checklist uh, do you think that you are just uh, randomly observing students in a class with a checklist can you gain some valid information about students let's remove all the negative options this is extremely uh, you know an informal way of checking your students and a random way of checking uh, students this can be done while teaching in a class randomly to see maybe you've assigned them a task and they are doing it but you cannot yield valid information uh, unless uh, you have some output in the form of some writing from a student so it cannot be done you cannot have a checklist in class and go from student a to z and see that oh yes he's writing that means he has understood the concept maybe he might not the your student might not be writing what you have assigned your student might be playing some game uh, with a friend or might writing something else so uh, this cannot be done with a random observation so let's remove the negative options uh, student self-assessment uh, you know the slow learners they can be uh, wrong while doing the self-assessment as well so this is totally a negative option peer assessment sometimes peer assessment is not quite a valid uh, option so our right answer is actually student journaling and uh, let's see what student journaling is all about peer assessment is done when you just do the cross checking in class and uh, sometimes let's say i have a, uh, a best friend and she might uh, mark my wrong answer even the right one so that i don't have to uh, face the music or uh, being scolded by the teacher so she might do me a favor so sometimes peer assessment cannot give us valid results so uh, let's say what student journaling is all about and why this seems to be the right answer uh, you know uh, when I collected some information about this topic uh, this is what I got uh, journaling helps students to be less restrained when expressing themselves it also gives students time to organize their thoughts and prepare responses which can give them extra confidence they need to practice participate in classroom discussions and uh, look at this piece of information journaling is also a way for teachers to learn more about their students you get to know a lot in the form of the output given by your students the journal records the students individual travel through the academic world so journals are a great assessment tool look at this piece of information they are a great assessment tool for teachers they reveal the students level of comprehension as well as what students require in order to improve problem areas so based on the information that we got let's review this question once again uh, we already knew, uh, we read a lot about student journaling that how this helps in getting to know your students in detail and to understand what have they or what sort of comprehension do they have of the concept of the topic so this is the most appropriate method in this case to yield valid information about what they have understood what they know because they're giving you a, a form of out, uh, out output by writing a journal about a particular activity or a topic conducted in class so therefore uh, we'll remove all the distractors informal observation is not an authentic 
way similarly self assessment can go wrong and peer assessment can also be done uh, without authenticity so here student journaling seems to be the right answer however you have your own judgment uh, you can uh, contradict with me and see, uh, make your own answer google the information like i did and try to uh, figure out the right answer okay so let's see the next question students learn most effectively when they are able to participate actively in the learning which one of the following is the main cause for making learners passive observers now here is uh, our keywords are what makes our students passive observers they are not involved in any activity but they are just passively learning no activity is going on number 1 having fixed seating plans with students sitting in rows every teacher organizes their own seating plan differently for each class a flexible seating arrangement with no permanent arrangement student seating plans change according to the requirements of the lesson so one key factor is that uh, negative answers will always be wrong positive options will always be correct so this question is based on classroom management uh, part of the exam now look at the options given let's review this option the last option student seating plans change according to the requirements of the lesson let's say an english teacher wants to have a, you know active discussion in the class so she makes a group arrangement let's say history teacher wants to have a u shape arrangement in class because she wants to show some historical clippings in the classroom so uh, as per the subjects the uh, requirement of the lesson seating plans keep on changing to uh, give students to render your students maximum learning options so so this seems to be a positive option it it happens usually in our school on daily basis because we keep on changing the arrangement as per our teaching goals or objectives a flexible seating arrangement with no permanent arrangement this uh, uh, option is similar to the previous one the last one obviously there has to be a flexible seating arrangement with no permanent arrangement because students need to change their arrangement according to the objectives of the lesson so this seems to be a positive option every teacher organizes their own seating plan differently for each class obviously if a teacher is teaching drama she will uh, have more space in the middle she can have role plays in the middle of the class maybe history teacher also wants some role play so she can have also um, a big space in the middle and groups on sides or maybe maths teacher just wants to focus on the board so she can have another seating plan so obviously every teacher will have her own seating plan differently according to the class but if you have fixed seating plans with students sitting in rows what happens a passive learner will know that okay uh, my place is here on the side and i can hide behind the student and i can avoid participation in class so this seems to be a very negative option because the good ones will know students with high efficacy levels and confident students will know that uh, oh really we want to uh, participate in class discussions and luckily we are sitting in the in front by choice and uh, it's okay uh, let's uh, be the you know ruler in the class and <laughs> rule it with our intelligence so this seems to be the negative option and let's see the information that i collected for you according to me this seems to be the right answer but you can contradict with me and choose your own answer because i don't have a check script for these answers i just try to gather the information and uh, try to figure out what seems to be the right answer okay so when you create a seating chart some students will think that you are picking favorites if you have a fixed seating plan students might think and this is reality based obviously even i used to think when i was a student that the teacher is picking favorites it might create resent resentment and distrust in your students because they'll think oh the good ones are given this place and we are just made to sit like a servant here and there in the corners so this might happen studies have uh, reported that seating arrangements impact the learning process students occupying the front rows are more attentive uh, that those than those in the back and the student in front are the ones who generally answer all the questions in class this is all based on practical observation i agree with that uh, classroom arrangement from a student's point of view symbolizes their personality uh the mostly the diligent focused students occupy the front rows in order not to miss out any vital information whereas the laid back or more casual students opt for the back benches to avoid being noticed by the educators 
this is also reality based i fully agree with that so some students prefer sitting near doors and windows as it provides them with sufficient distractions to escape the monotony of the lessons taught pranks whispering or passing of notes doodling it's frequent among the students who are ge who generally sit in the back so having a fixed seating plan will allow your students that okay i'm sitting here i can uh, hide in the class i can uh, distract get distracted myself and i can do whatever i want therefore seating arrangements may be the cause of decline of the student if you have a sick, fixed seating arrangement it can be the cause of decline performance uh, uh, as attention span concentration comprehension and the retaining of information can be influenced by where the student chooses to sit so if a student knows that okay my uh, teacher knows that this is a passive learner so let me change have a flexible sitting plan let me sit, sit uh, this passive student with the best student of the class today and let me change his seat uh, uh, to uh, and make him sit with the next best student of the class the next day so the student will be getting opportunity of shadow learning from the best students in the class but having a fixed seating plan seems to be quite negative uh, it's going to curb all the creativity in the classroom so i hope you agree with my answer anyways you can differ with me as well and uh, figure out your own answers too so let's see what our next question is all about which of the following statements about students self-efficacy is most accurate number one let's i'll go i'll be highlighting things for you students with high levels of self-efficacy work harder and persist students with high levels of self-efficacy uh, participate less in the classroom activities students with high levels of self-efficacy work and persist less students with low self-efficacy are most tolerant of failure okay uh, so let me tell you that uh, let's review all the options and analyze them our first uh, our last option says students with low self-efficacy are more tolerant of failure students with uh, low self-efficacy are not at all tolerant of failure but they are extremely afraid of failure that's why they have low self-efficacy and they hesitate to participate or take initiative that's why this option seems to be wrong students with high levels of self-efficacy work and persist less uh, this option is totally wrong because students who have high levels of self-efficacy they work more and they are extremely persistent they like to work and they stay persistent throughout that's why they have high levels of self-efficacy so this is a self-contradictory statement that's why it's totally wrong let's review our next option students with high levels of self-efficacy participate less in the classroom activities uh, this is extremely self-contradictory statement because a student with which has ha, who has high level of self-efficacy obviously will participate the most in the classroom so this seems to be a totally wrong option let's review our last option students with high levels of self-efficacy work harder and persist obviously if someone is the uh, you know jewel in the crown of your class someone is the topmost performance with high self-efficacy level you must have seen those two students are the best of all they always work harder and they persist longer they continue to be the same because they are the top notch uh, you know people and the high scorers of your class they are the go getters of your class and they keep on working with same zeal same enthusiasm that's why if you look at the question which of the following statement about students with self efficacy is most accurate this statement seems to be the most accurate ones uh, you can defer with me once again if you want to figure out so let's see what self-efficacy is all about self-efficacy beliefs are self perceptions uh, that individuals hold about their capabilities self-efficacy beliefs provide foundation for human motivation well-being and personal accomplishment so especially the evidence has shown that students with high self-efficacy in various academic domains choose to engage in tasks that foster the development of their knowledge and skills and abilities in those areas. Exert effort in the face of difficulty. They exert a lot of effort and persist longer at challenging tasks. So this information confirms that the first statement in the question is totally the right answer so let's review our next question for which learning style would activities based on computer graphics maps graphs charts posters and diagrams be the most suitable 
so you have to see that for which learning style uh, activities such as computer graphics maps graphs charts posters and diagrams be most suitable you can have a look uh, at this this student is learning uh, in a different style whereas this student is immediately uh, imagining the word uh, the word is table and the student is imagining imagining the picture of the table that all right uh, the student can relate by having a visual uh, in the mind so uh, the options are tactile learners auditory learners kinesthetic learners or visual learners so uh, which learning style would activities based on computer graphics, maps, graphs, charts, posters and diagrams? You can, I think it's a very easy question you can already make out. But let's see what uh, visual learners are. Visual or spatial learning style is a learning style that requires visual aids, images, diagrams or graphs to help retain information and guide the learning process including infographics, photos throughout your presentation and slides it's a great way to help your audience understand information. So uh, there are two main uh, ways people learn. That is visual learners. They think in pictures rather than words. They have a different brain organization than auditory sequential learners and they learn better visually than uh, auditorily. So uh, based on this piece of information, uh, the answer of this question is the visual learners. Uh, it's uh, anyways it's very obvious and very clear because if you have graphs maps and all that in mind so obviously you're a visual learner you're learning with the help of pictures mentioned in graphs posters and all that uh, so our next question is which one of the following statement represents a difference between a project and project based learning so what's the difference between the keywords are which statement presents or portrays the difference between a project and a project based learning? Let's see our options. Project based learning focuses mainly on the final product and uh, the project focuses on both process and product. So which one of the following statement represents difference between a project and project based? Here it's saying that project based learning focuses mainly on the final product and the project focuses on both uh, process and the product actually it's the reverse of that project based learning focuses on the process as well as the final product but project learn um, a project is the one uh, which uh, focuses on only the final project which you have to present so this is a wrong option let's review our last uh, second last option a project needs more planning than project based learning actually both need a lot of planning so this is wrong both are same thing and can be used interchange both are not the same they cannot be used interchangeably so this is also a wrong option let's see this option the second option project based learning requires teacher guidance and team collaboration while the project could be done without the teacher guidance and team collaboration so uh, this seems to be quite true because uh, what happens in a project based learning uh, it's the process that you want your students to go through so that they collaborate with their teammates and uh, develop uh, socialization skills and learn from their peers. The basic purpose is actually that. So you want them to undergo this entire process because you want them to develop skills like collaboration with their peers. And uh, the project could be done without the teacher guidance and team collaboration at home. Uh, students get projects usually and uh, the teacher is not involved. The teacher has guided them already about the project and they assemble the project with the help of their team members. Sometimes they take guidance from their parents or brothers or sisters, their siblings at home. So this seems to be the right option according to me. Anyways, you can defer with me because I don't have answers for these questions. Uh, based on my information that I collected, this seems to be the right answer so let's see the information that I collected to prove my answer project based learning or PBL it's a short form of that it's a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real world and personally meaningful project okay so this is project based learning projects can represent a range of tasks that can be done at home so see uh, I already discussed this with you that it can represent many tasks that can be done at home or in the classroom with the class uh, your peers or by parents or groups of students quickly or over time sometimes projects can be completed within the class 
uh, for example you assign dnt projects to students sometimes they complete in class sometimes they take it home and they do get help of their parents their siblings while project based learning also features projects but in pbl the focus is more on the process of learning and learner peer con uh, content interaction uh, that the end product uh, itself so you can see the difference between project based learning and projects project making is different it can be done without a teacher at home and project based learning involves a lot of uh, you know sharing and peer work with your team members and it is the it's the entire process of learning and learner peer content interaction and the end product itself so there are these are the differences they are not at all the same for example doing a project and uh, project based learning uh, so uh, an add on to the traditional instruction at the end or alongside of the unit whereas project based learning instruction integrated into the project the project project is the unit it follows that uh, here you follow the directions of the teacher to complete the project this one is driven by student inquiry so this is based on inquiry based learning it focuses on the main product this focuses on the product as well as the process uh, and this is mostly unrelated to understand uh, standards and skills this is aligned to academic standards and success skills it can be completed alone or at home this involves collaboration with students and in class guidance from the teacher this remains within the school world and has real world context and application so this the projects are usually related to uh, things uh, related to school but uh, project based learning involves real world scenarios uh, for example you can tell your students uh, about uh, environment that uh, they have to complete so and so project keeping the environment problems in uh, 2050 so this is project based learning they have to apprehend they have to predict and then they have to complete the project based on research so this is quite different from project based learning end result of the project displayed in the classroom you always make a project let's say you have to make um you know uh, a statue of something or you have to make a 3d model in science of the respiratory system and you display it in the class but results of the projects shared beyond the classroom with public and audience here you can share the uh, project based learning results in an uh, in public and in audience for example there are many examples in uae so many exhibitions are being conducted where uh, pro project learning based uh, results are being shared uh, a science exhibition used to be held when covid-19 was not there and students uh, the entire process was being shared students would develop new new things and they would share their scientific achievements uh this is another slide you can review it you can take a screenshot and review it yourself and uh, there is another question i'm not sure about this answer but i've included it you can do your research and try to figure out the answer because i don't have a check script so i'm not very sure about the answer but i thought tomorrow you have exam so let me give you maximum questions which you can uh, search the answers of so the question is which of the following forms of professional development help the teacher further bridge the gap between the theoretical knowledge and practical application so you see training workshops in training workshops you just get the practical theoretical knowledge educational literature review you are just reviewing it yourself educational conferences you just get the information in your educational conferences but what do you do in brainstorming sessions uh you know things are being discussed and new ideas are being shared uh in the brainstorming eliciting happens or uh, you are being elicited that uh, what you already know bridge the gap between the theoretical knowledge and practical application and uh, there is an information gap which is being figured out through brainstorming and then uh, the new things are being integrated with the help of brainstorming sessions so uh, according to me this seems to be the right answer but again you can figure out yourself i'm not sure about this answer uh, another question is what is the most effective tool for collecting data to study the relationship between students achievement and the number of days of attendance 
so what is the most effective tool you have to collect data to study the relationship students achievement and the number of days of attendance what's the correlation with that so distributing a questionnaire to the students teachers and parents or administrating student achievement tests or uh, conducting interviews with students teachers and parents and reviewing the records and documents related to the study so one of the smartest ways to assess students achievement is to use previous feedback as the assessment tool once you know that what didn't work the last time for a student it will help you uh, form new quizzes or assessment material to gauge the process of uh, students so based on that you can figure out your answer but i'm not at all sure about this confusing question so if you get to know the answer do let me know as well so that was all from my side uh, tomorrow is your exam i wish you the very very best of luck and do let me know when you come back after the exam and please uh, like this video and drop some comments as well uh, that matters a lot for our stability on youtube and i'll see you in my next video